Thanks for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you. I was born not far from here, a few blocks from this place, on the corner of Strachany Chabana and Kanegin Illuminisa streets. I've lived in America for almost 50 years. Today, America is my homeland, I can say, which I live in. But Serbia is my fatherland, which lives in my heart. Whenever I can, I come here. During the unfortunate 1990s, I very often came here. With the aim of helping Serbia in the difficult circumstances which were then. For us Serbs who lived in America, older folks and others, and around the world as members of the second generation, maybe about two million Serbs and more, it was difficult. Especially for us in America, like when we talk about the friendship that existed between America and Serbia, it was very difficult for us when it came to a split between Belgrade and Washington. Thus, it was unusually hard for us to take the right stand. It's like when you have a father and a mother and you love them both. But they're getting divorced. And now they expect you to decide whether you love one more or one less. So we found ourselves in a situation quite emotionally difficult, though later it turned out practical. Thanks to our efforts, we later managed to reconcile these things in Washington and establish a good relationship with the government of that time. The problem was that we did not have good communications with Belgrade. They were always somehow strained and did not allow, how would I would say, a natural flow between people who understood each other and wanted to achieve the same goal. As regards America, you know, I can freely say this, and I wrote about it in my book Decade of Illusion, that America had not wanted Yugoslavia to fall apart, and in particular it did not have any problems with the Serbs as such. What happened to the Serbs, unfortunately, was that when Yugoslavia broke apart, in America, most people, intellectuals and elites, did not even know who the Serbs actually were. Many people mixed up Serbia with Siberia and didn't understand much. And we, within Yugoslavia, had lost our identity. The Americans saw us as Yugoslavs, and now, when Yugoslavia broke up, the Croats were Croats, great nationalists, but they were forgiven this because they were skilled in how to straighten out such things. At the same time, since we had lost that identity, other enemies of the Serbs, not only Croats, Albanians and others, they used huge money and effort to build an identity for Serbia. Just imagine, your enemies create an identity for a friendly nation and completely reverse the image of what you were. And this thing we're talking about, a hundred-year jubilee, it's an enormous proof. The Serbian flag was one of the only two or three that had ever been flown on the White House. The president himself also spoke about Serbia with great praise. Serbia had diplomatic relations since the 19th century and very good relations with America. In two world wars, we were on the same side. So, all these are facts. Mr. Zoran. And these facts in themselves tell how this could have happened. This is a big problem and we can't blame others. I have to be honest about this. As Dostoevsky wrote in one of his novels, when some misfortune happens to us, let's first look at ourselves and see what we contributed to it. You know, I already mentioned a problem, a problem of identity. In America, they must recognize who the Serbs are. You thus have a situation where our students, who in America we help with scholarships, when they come to America and accept jobs, believe me, a large number of these students avoid saying they're Serbs. Why? Because the image of Serbia is still negative. Why is it negative? Because Serbia for years, for decades, since the breakup of Yugoslavia, has been doing nothing that should be done.
especially in America, to change that image. And this is a great tragedy, and it's related to the fact that Serbs abroad, in the diaspora, cannot connect with the motherland. The motherland somehow avoids that. And because of the gap that exists between the motherland and Serbs in the diaspora, this bridge has still not been built. Ever since the beginning of 1944, when there took place a change of government and a creation of a new Yugoslavia, the second Yugoslavia. This relationship has to change because it is very important to keep in mind what other nations and nationalists have shown in America, that it's very important to speak about yourself. You have to say, I am this person, I do this, I want to see what your interests are in America and that we match those interests. You know, in geopolitics, so to say, interests are the main thing, and Serbia can find contact points with those interests. It had many of those in the 90s during the wars, but did not use them, did not understand them, did not exploit them as was needed. And here is a big problem, because in order to regain that identity, and so that a future generation will once again put a Serbian flag on the White House, we need to build that bridge with the one-third of Serbs who live abroad. Of those hundred years of relations between America and Serbia, I did not witness only those 20 before I was born. But since I started to remember, and that was immediately after the Second World War, all our hopes were placed in America. Somebody met my mother and told her that in the nearby forest he'd seen American soldiers. And she says, I knew he was lying to me, but I loved him for telling me that. I think that in the whole of Eastern Europe, which fell under the communist jackboot, all hope was on America. Britain betrayed us, but the defeated side believed that America had not. Already in the United States at that time were our king, our bishop Nikolai Velimirovic, our great poet Jovan Ducic, Rasko Petrovic, and so many others. What was most moving was the belief that if we'd been able to reach America and touch her coast with our fingers, we would solve all our problems. My comrades in Koloshin set out to flee to America on horseback. They stole horses from a cooperative, mounted them and set off. They were caught already at the first bend in the road. They were arrested and taken through the town carrying sandwich boards on which was a written I wanted to flee to America. They were exiled to a desert island, and I'm thinking of the one which later became known as Goliotok. What was also famous and glorious was that the Yugoslav army in the fatherland saved 500 American pilots. 
and that here in the village of Pranyani, the farmers levelled the fields for several months so that planes could land. And the pilots were accommodated in farmers' houses in Pranyani and round about and welcomed as brothers. The defeated side, which my family belonged to also, lived under great occupation and a reign of terror. But we knew whose side we were on, and it was especially important that America knew it too. Whoever fled somewhere hoped to reach America and thus solve all their problems. We already knew that there were several hundred thousand Serbs living in America and no one had ever complained about any problem whatsoever that he experienced there. We believe that America knows everything, records everything, knows the whole truth, and that the day will come when America will open the book and say, everything you've talked about so far, you've talked about, and now you will hear the truth and the correct version. That's why everything that happened in our time was for us the biggest shock and biggest defeat. We hope that it was only one big misunderstanding, one great irony of history and that the day would come again as it once used to be when, along with our Bishop Nikolai, our great minstrel Petar Pedrunovic went to America to invite volunteers to fight at the Salonika front. And when he sung our heroic songs to Tesla in New York, and Tesla wept. There was also Pupin, who, as we have already heard, asked for a loan from Rockefeller to help Serbia. When asked by what he guarantees it will be possible to return the loan, Pupin responded, Is everything I possess enough? If Serbia is ruined, let me be ruined too. Nowadays, we are hearing for the first time the whole truth about Tesla, the truth about Pupin and the truth about Bishop Nikolai and others. We didn't know, for example, that Pupin received the Pulitzer Prize for his book From Immigrant to Inventor, for this book was not in our school reading list. It was also discovered that, when it was translated into Serbian, a part in which he writes about St. Sava was removed. In the same way that the part in Tesla's autobiography, where he writes about his religion, was also removed. What is written in the original is preserved. They arrived in the New York port as complete nobodies and became so famous and celebrated all over the world, thanks to America and to that torch on the Statue of Liberty towards which the peoples of Eastern Europe headed. We hope that that America will come to exist again.
rekli u to vreme do posle prvog svetskog rata Tesla After the First World War, Tesla was a name that was known throughout America. For example, he went into a barber shop in a small town in Ohio, where people waiting for a shave would be talking and exchanging news. Those people would know about Tesla. The fact that he was relatively forgotten later was always relative, because he was on the front cover of Time magazine in the 1930s, when he was already an old man. That came later. So one very well-known man, one of the people who were expected to say where the future would start, and America is a country turned towards the future, so to say futuristically oriented, and as I write in my book, Tesla was the Wizard of Oz. At the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, America takes a new direction and replaces the fear of change with enthusiasm for change. The writer Frank Baum came to this exhibition as a young man, and it gave him the idea for the Wizard of Oz. The man who made possible the World's Fair in Chicago was Nikola Tesla. So through the pearly gate, he in a way introduced America into modernity. On the other hand, you have Michael Pupin, who is a practical man, a friend or acquaintance of several American presidents. By the way, Wilson was president of America at the time. He knew Tesla too. Pupin, to use today's term, lobbied very hard. His mode of political thinking was very modern. Through his connections and his friends, he strove to achieve the best for his country. I think these two people are in the forefront of this cooperation. There's something I would always like to emphasize. There's one essential similarity, in fact more than one, between America and Serbia. Both in Serbia and in America, there is the idea, defined by Thomas Jefferson, of the honorable or honest peasant. The virtuous yeoman. Jefferson thought that a man who has his own land, who has his own tools, cannot be influenced by anyone, neither the one who employs him nor the one who gives him an apartment. This means the independent man is a politically free factor. This is a very similar idea to that of the peasant in Serbia. Both countries had no aristocracy and were proud of that. Both America and Serbia, at the same time that we're talking about, speak of themselves as classless societies. That's not entirely true. In every society you have classes. But you did not have the usual aristocracy, you did not have feudalism, and here they're very similar. Both Americans and Serbs are quite informal. They both try to see that form does not smother content. And finally, I think that the role of humor in the life of both the American and Serbian people is very important. And this, together with the lack of formalism, also brings us closer. So, this lack of aristocracy, the basic role of the independent peasant, informality and humour are the links that bind the two peoples, before and also after this important event. These are simply historical parallels that we should keep in mind. I taught American history at the Faculty of Political Science in Belgrade and the students reacted very nicely. It seems to me that there are many aspects of American life, I am now talking about us, which require greater cultural exchange, like everywhere. My own book about Tesla has had three printings in America which shows that there is some interest. The students in Belgrade were interested in American life. I'd like to write a collection of essays that in a direct way, understandable to the ordinary reader, would speak about many aspects of American life. In addition, the canon of American literature is important. For a time, there was a lot of translation in our country. Let's remember, America was very popular in Serbia. In the 1970s and 80s, it was really a culture close to us, especially regarding rock and roll and otherwise. Much American literature has been translated, but without any order. There are, for example, some very important books of Mark Twain that have not been translated. Therefore, I'd like that what's valuable in American culture is translated more systematically, with a greater degree of explanation. Here's an example. We think today about America as a country of spin doctors. That's what Socrates called the sophists. People who are capable of making a weaker reason stronger because they know how to talk. However, one of the greatest American political thinkers, Abraham Lincoln, who was an attorney by education, thought something completely different. 
There is his famous question, how many legs has a dog if we call its tail a leg? His answer is, it has four, because to call a tail a leg does not make a tail a leg. You know, one's got to be an optimist. This is simply the nature of the human situation. I hope it will happen. What is very important is not only the military alliance, and there were then many Serbian activists in America, and they were gathering soldiers for the Serbian army from the ranks of Serbian Americans. Many people came from Pittsburgh Steelworks or Colorado Mines to go to the Salonika Front. Then the question was, under whose command this army would be? But in essence, they were part of the armed forces that were fighting for the same thing. Therefore, I hope that recalling such events and insisting on cultural exchange also lead to a better understanding between the two peoples in the future. This event, like many others, has gained importance at the present time. First, we're not quite sure that it really happened. We do not know whether the flag was flying on the White House on July 28, 1918. Only the dispatch from our envoy in Washington testifies to this. Of course, what is important is that America was then a country friendly towards Serbia and that Woodrow Wilson, probably because of his friend Pupin, had an understanding for many Serbian aspirations, as well as for the aspirations of all the small nations in Eastern and Central Europe. President Wilson proclaimed the right of a people to self-determination on the basis of which countries such as Poland and Czechoslovakia gained statehood, on the basis of which Romania was enlarged, and on the basis of which emerged the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. As regards the date of July 28, 1918, it began to be marked this year, among other things, because of a very unusual advertising campaign by the American Embassy in Belgrade, which made a very beautiful and striking video spot about the event, about Pupin, about Serbs in the world. Thus, this event in itself has no real historical significance, but like everything else in history, it's more important that we think about events today than what really happened. We create our thinking about history on the basis of today's needs. And in that sense, the most interesting thing is the desire of the U.S. Embassy, about which we're not sure if it's a local initiative or some higher command, to show through a very, very striking and very decent campaign the friendship between Serbia and America. Whether it's a matter of an initiative of the American Embassy in Belgrade or a matter of a higher policy of the State Department, this exceptional video spot made by the Embassy, which is much, much better than almost any of our own advertising materials, actually serves to change the image of America amongst our public to show America to our public as a friendly country. But this spot and this campaign are not a reflection of real policies. This is in fact an extremely successful propaganda campaign that does not have any kind of influence on US policy. Which is guided quite by some much broader motives. How good it is for our public to believe in that friendship between America and Serbia, I don't know myself. 
because it's not the only time we've been lulled by our myths about the friendship of great powers. There's the famous story of belief in a French friendship. At certain times, France was certainly the patron of Yugoslavia, earlier of Serbia. But the basic mistake in the story of friendship between peoples and states is not just that. There's that trivial cliché. Between states, there is no friendship, there's only interest. But it's not just interest. Many states also make completely irrational moves for many, many reasons. Relations between the United States of America and Serbia are not only contained in these hundred years since the raising of the Serbian flag on the Capitol a hundred years ago in 1918, marking the end of the First World War, or the Great War, as it is commonly called. They have been in existence for more than 130 years, but the fact is that these relations may best be defined and in some way confirmed by our great scientists of Serbian origin who accomplished really great, grandiose works, working as actual American scientists and inventors. When I say this, I'm of course thinking above all of Nikola Tesla and Mikhailo Pupin, people who created a truly magnificent body of work through their inventions and patents. Where, through perfecting the technological base and giving mankind some great works, which changed the technological image of the world around us, not only in America, not only in Serbia, but practically over the whole planet, gave something which represents a contribution that Americans are also very well aware of. Of course, Nikola Tesla, as an inventor with about 300 patents, provided above all the basis for the second technological revolution, creating something which is primarily embodied in his synchronous and asynchronous motors, alternating current motors, and something which we call his system for the production, transmission and distribution of electrical energy over long distances. This is indeed something which the entire planet still uses today, which has marked all Tesla's greatness. Of course, with a variety of other inventions, above all that of radio, which is truly an invention for all time, high-frequency current, his generator on alternating current and something that makes him so topical today, his system of wireless transmission of electrical energy and telecommunications, something that Tesla anticipated and wanted to realize through his great experiment and project that he unfortunately never completed, which he worked on on Long Island in his famous laboratory at Wardenclyffe. So, Tesla is recognized as a visionary, as a man of great ideas and grandiose solutions. And that's just what makes him a Serbian-American scientist, a man from this region, of Serbian origin, one who practically realized all his key patents in the United States of America. Pupin had a similar starting point to Tesla. Thus, also born in this region, a man who was also educated in Austro-Hungarian schools like Tesla, but who, from being an immigrant, came to be an inventor, as states the title of the book for which in 1924 he received the Pulitzer Prize. A man who also realized some of the capital projects that changed, so to say, the essence and technology, above all in the field of telephony, the, the famous poop in coils and many other inventions. Thus someone who made a significant contribution, together with the then US President Woodrow Wilson, through the League of Nations, a contribution as to how the borders of Yugoslavia would look. Thus someone who really did great things, not only for Serbia, but for all the other countries on ex-Yugoslav territory and who, as a university professor, lectured at Columbia University and left a significant heritage through a whole series of scientific papers. Even today, Pupin is a big name in the United States and represents this link between Serbia and America. 
And yet another great scientist of Serbian origin who did great things which were recognized primarily in the United States was Milutin Milankovic. His famous canon of the Earth's insulation, all his theories of the Ice Age, which in fact changed the climate on Earth over millennium-long periods, but unavoidably changed it due to differences in rotation and relative positions between the Earth, Sun and Moon, are theories that were recognized above all in the United States. And when Milutin Milankovic was almost unknown here in Serbia, and that was not so long ago, in the late 1970s, the Americans practically invented real physical models which proved that all Milankovic's theories were in incredibly precise and accurate. Even though they cover millennium-long periods of the life of planet Earth. So, those are all people who have permanently woven their work into the life of this planet, into its technological development, and into everything that today represents, in fact, the basis of the modern era in which we live. And above all, being active or being recognized in the United States, but again, as people for whom it was very well known that they re represented, let me say, the best that could be given by a small but in this sense significant country, such as Serbia. The decision by President Wilson to raise the Serbian flag above the White House was historic. In fact, it was the first time ever in our history that a foreign flag was raised alongside the American flag on the White House. Um, the only other time that's ever happened in our history was in 1920 when a decision was taken to raise the French flag above the White House. And the reason that President Wilson did this was as an extraordinary sign of, of respect to the Serbian people for the huge sacrifices which they underwent during World War I as our allies. During that period, Serbia was recognized in the United States for, for the incredible pain and suffering that it was going through during the war. There were campaigns all across America to raise money for our Serbian allies. America was also providing um, humanitarian support, sending medical missions um, to Serbia, and thousands of Serbian Americans volunteered to join their Serbian brethren on Corfu and eventually fought their way back into Belgrade and to liberate Serbia from the Austro-Hungarian um, occupation. So this sign and the decision, uh, I think, was a very powerful signal of, of how Americans were looking at the war in Europe, but also at Serbia in particular. It was also very much driven by the personal ties between Americans and Serbs, led first and foremost by uh, Mikhail Pupin, who was Serbia's honorary consul at the time, and his personal um, friendship with Pre President Woodrow Wilson. They both came out of academic circles. Um, they know, knew each other from that period. But Mikhail Pupin was a strong advocate for Serbia during this period, and through his efforts, I think, brought issues to the attention of the president, which led to this decision to raise the Serbian flag over the, the White House. The second part of this entire history, you know, 100 years is, of course, a very important period um, to, to, to look back on. But it also, to my mind, reflects more the strength of Serbian-American relations throughout um, history, where 1918 wasn't an exception, but was very much more the norm in our relationship. Americans and Serbians were also allies fighting uh, shoulder to shoulder in World War II against fascism. Um, we will forever be grateful to Serbs who helped to rescue hundreds of American airmen who were shot down over Serbian airspace um, as they fought against the Nazis in World War II. And the sacrifice of the Serbian people during that period to risk everything in order to save these strangers, I think, was also a great reflection of the friendship and the ties between our people. Even after World War II, when Yugoslavia was a communist nation and certainly didn't fit with our ideological views, 
Um, when the common form and when Moscow invoked sanctions against Serbia, it was the American people who offered assistance, American food when Serbia was on the brink of starvation or Yugoslavia was on the brink of starvation. These are all examples, I think, of the ties between our nations driven first and foremost by person-to-person -person ties between Serbs and Americans, and especially led by Serbian Americans in the United States, who always kept touch with their homeland, always kept touch with what was going on back home, and have always served as an important bridge of understanding between Americans and Serbs. Mikhail Pupin is a great example, Nikola Tesla, but in fact, all of American life, from sport, through culture, through academia, science, are underpinned by the important role that Serbs and Serbian Americans have played um, in our own society. We have greatly benefited from everything that Serbia has offered to us. And not only did Wilson want to show gratitude to Serbia in 1918, but we today also want to use this opportunity to say thanks to Serbia for all that they have contributed to our country over the last 100 years. Exactly a hundred years ago, the Serbian flag really did fly over the White House. But not just that. It was the last act of a great drama that took place in America during the Great War. And it was the role of Mihailo Pupin which completely astonished me. I didn't expect, I didn't believe that one man such as Mihailo Pupin for them, Michael Pupin could have had such close contacts. Now we're talking about contacts with Woodrow Wilson, but we'll leave that aside. They did indeed culminate in Wilson's decision to proclaim a day of Serbia in America, but were effected primarily with the American military. In the committees of the association that Michael Pupin organized, collect aid during the Great War, were setting admirals at the top of the American military. When founding NASA, he invented sonar, and a way of communicating with airplanes in flight. That was the tool that Michael Pupin had. First there took place a small miracle which is not spoken about today. The American state gave him the right and the duty to announce in 1917 that America entered the First World War on the front page of the New York Times. This was not done by the American president, it was not done by an American admiral, it was done by Michael Pupin, saying science will be victorious and will win this war. Do you not see that its end is closer than its beginning? We have found a way to detect and destroy enemy submarines. What is also very important is that our academic public often claims, even though the Americans claim otherwise, that there was no close relationship between Woodrow Wilson and Michael Pupin. There was, and I'll tell you which archive guards that truth, the archive of the Wilson Institute in America, which holds Wilson's biography of his first wife. It's not published, but can be read if you ask for it and knock on the right door. And you will see in that that in his biography, Wilson's wife says, as our friend Michael Pupin would have said, and then quotes him. And again and again she mentions Michael Pupin and it's not at all by chance. And it's a big and important place where a bold man, fearless, one who has all the titles, is president of all possible associations, at that time already a member of two academies of science, professor, scientist and doctor, feels that his goal is nevertheless a fight for justice and goes fearlessly to conquer what he thinks is best and most valuable during and at the end of the Great War. And here I recall the Paris Peace Conference, which is a continuation of this act, when Woodrow Wilson signs maps drawn by Jovan Svijic and Douglas Johnson, a friend of Pupin who was secretary of the New York Academy of Sciences when Michael Pupin was president. Douglas Johnson was also his colleague from Columbia University. Two memoranda written by Pupin were accepted in their entirety. Even today, we must remember, most of the Adriatic coast, Medjumurje, Baranya, a large part from Bled to Triglav, and of course Pupin's Banat, all became part of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, thanks to Pupin's influence and not just to his efforts. He did his very 
best to explain everything in his memoranda, but it was his influence which led to Woodrow Wilson signing those maps. It is a more important place than the place where the Serbian flag flew over the White House. And, I would say, more important and more beautiful is that Woodrow Wilson asked that all American peoples, whoever they are and whichever religion they profess, pray that day in their churches for the freedom and salvation of the suffering Serbian people. And this proclamation of his is the heart that beats, both with the ardour of Michael Pupin and the ardour of Woodrow Wilson. And I must say that nothing would be so in modern civilization if we did not have Serbian great men. Never was Michael Pupin ever alone, neither in science nor inventions nor in this fight for justice. Nikola Tesla steps upright alongside him. You know, after the assassination by Gavrilo Princip, the very beginning of the war, Nikola Tesla was the first to appear in the American press, followed by a big and important letter from Pupin. All associations, all volunteers, every help, but Pupin was a systematic man. Here was the difference. He was able to handle and negotiate with an admiral of the Navy. Nikola Tesla was able to save through his vision, a scientific vision of the whole world. Different characters, but really always on the same path. A hundred years after the raising of the Serbian flag is important for several reasons. This was the first time that America honoured another nation. This happened only twice in its history, the only time in the 20th century. The first time it was for the glory and honour of the Serbian people. To forget it, or as some do today, deny it, is completely absurd. It's the basis for building the better relationship we need with all the countries of this world, particularly with America. How can we find ourselves on the map of common interests and common denominators if we deny what surely connects us? Recently, Bishop Irene in the US Congress, using his native English language, held a service in honour of this centenary. You know how the congressman listened to him. I believe this is as important as the raising of the flag. We must not forget, we must not deny, we must not allow that America marks this while our state remains silent, and I must say, too silent. The video spots which run and the stories that run do so on the part of the United States. But the Serbian people know only how to say through individuals that it was not so, that it did not happen that way, that additional evidence needs to be found. Well, what's the extra evidence? I saw the paper with Wilson's signature by which the decision was made to mark the day of Serbia and America, and on that paper the two flags fly to meet each other. It was never like this again. Neither America is the same nor is Serbia the same as a hundred years ago. But a common denominator is needed. And look, here is one grain, noble, pure, sublime. We can only stand in full respect. We can bow down. We cannot dispute what really happened one hundred years ago.